may be a good thing tonight. Well, the Wi-Fi is in. Good evening. Welcome to the July 15th regular meeting of the Town Council. We are about to begin. So item number one is call to order. Item number two, can we have the everybody quiet, please? We are going to start the meeting. Thank you. Can everybody hear? We are having some technical difficulties this evening. Can everybody hear me all right, even in the back of the room? Okay, thank you. Um, we do have some technical difficulties this evening, so thank you for your patience while staff scrambled to give us old school hard copies of, <laughs> of, of our agenda this evening. So um, item number two, now that we've called the meeting to order, is the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you please rise and join me? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, all. all right, item number three is roll call. Councilor Baybay? Present. Councilor Donovan? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Blaze? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Council Chair Holbrook? And I'm here too. So, our next item is item number four, which is general public comments. Before we get started, you do need to state your name, address. You have three minutes to speak, and general public comments is for non-action items. So if anybody wishes to speak, please step right up to the podium and your name and address, please. Very quick, because I know you have a big agenda. Marge DeSanctis, 54 Beach Ridge Road. I had read in the leader a while ago that that motel that had burned on Route 1 several years ago was supposed to be taken down by the, sometime in June, and I see that it's still there, and I just wanted to see if there was any follow-up on cleaning up that two-and-a-half-year-old burned-out motel. Do you know that? I, um, we'll go ahead and indulge. Let Tom Hall respond to that. Yes, we're working with the property owner. Uh, we had a, uh, an agreement to have the structure, portion of the structure raised in the month of June. There were some difficulties with that agreement, and we're actually uh, preparing to bring a matter before council as soon as their next meeting in August um, to have the town intercede and actually accomplish the, demol uh, the demolition on our behalf. Thank you, Tom. Does anybody else wish to speak for general public comments? All right, and going and seeing none, we're going to close the general public comments. Item number five, minutes of the June 17th, 2015 regular meeting and June 24th, 2015 meeting. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. And any discussion? Errors, omissions? And seeing none, all those in favor, and that is unanimous. Item number six is adjustments to the agenda. There are none at this time. Item number seven is treasurer's warrants, which I will sign throughout the meeting, which brings us to our next item, which is order number 15-049. It is a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to the Chapter 405 Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, allowing for food processing facilities within the highest Parkway Zone District, or HP, and to establish food processing facility performance standards. Again, this is a public hearing. Does anybody wish to speak on this item. And saying none, I will close the general public uh, the public hearing. And can I have a motion? So moved. Second. And any discussion? I'd just okay. like to mention that the uh, this was reviewed by the planning board on Monday evening and uh, nobody from the uh, town stood up and disapproved this and they asked a lot of good questions and Karen Martin from Sedco was there to answer all the questions and they basically came out of it saying uh, we pass, uh, pass our recommendation on to the council to approve it. Thank you, Ed. Does anybody else have any? Jean Marie? Um, as a member of Long Range Planning, we've been looking at this for quite a while and I know um, our group was very enthusiastically supports this, so uh, I think it'd be a good addition to the Hoggis Parkway. And I would like to thank Karen Martin and Sedco for their work on this. Anybody else? All right. Well, hopefully, um, just my my comment on that would be hopefully we can continue to see some positive growth in Hoggis Park, and maybe this will allure. Some, some new business to come in and 
and consider developing at that site. So on to the main, main item. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. On to the next item is order number 15-050 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to the Town of Scarborough official zoning map to adjust the boundary of Highgate Parkway Zoning District HP. Again, this is a public hearing. Does anybody wish to speak on this item? And seeing none, I will close the comment section and pleasure of the council. Move approval. Second. And just um, for discussionary purposes, this, men this second order goes hand in hand with our previous order to just correct the, in our zoning ordinance that these are now allowed uses in the map. Um, is there any discussion from Ed? This was also approved by the planning board on Monday. Thank you. And anybody else? All right, none. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Next item, order number 15-055 is a 7 p.m. public hearing in action on the new request for a food handler's license from Lisa Harming doing business as Harmon's Dairy Bar located at 3 Spurwink Road. Again, this is a public hearing. Does anybody wish to speak on this item? And seeing none, I will close comment. And this is a <coughs> request, so pleasure of the council. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Wish them good luck. Yeah, Jean Marie. Any ice cream? I'm happy with Seymour and Scarborough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go for a Sunday. All right, and anybody else? Okay. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. There is no old business at this time, so we will move into new business, which is order number 15-056, first reading and schedule a public hearing, and second reading on the proposed <coughs> fiscal year 2016 school budget. Does anybody wish to speak on this item? <laughs> I thought they were here for the dairy bar. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, council members. My name is Dr. Catherine Miles. I hold a PhD from the University of Delaware in cognitive development and education. I do not have children of my own, and yet um, I find that this budget is too low. I would love you to tax me higher on this. I believe in education for education's sake, but I also want to suggest to you that I think the current budget is very short-sighted in terms of the overall economic well-being of this town. Um, according to the Department of Education in the U.S. Census, um, currently someone who holds a high school degree makes an average salary of $30,400. Someone with an associate's degree makes a salary of $38,200, and someone with a bachelor's degree, $52,200. Over the course of someone's earning potential, that's over $981,000 difference between someone with a bachelor's degree and a high school degree. If you took a look at the top 20 colleges in the United States versus those that are considered second-tier colleges, again, there's a difference of approximately $28,000 per year in an individual's earning potential. That's over $1.1 million over that student's lifetime. Given that there are currently approximately um, 1,000 students at the high school and more when you account, take into account the um, grade school, we're looking at something on the order of $1 billion in terms of earning potential that you may very well be interfering with by passing this budget. I've served on three different admissions councils for three different colleges, and I'm here to tell you that the budget as it stands and the things that will be cut will make it next to impossible for these students to be accepted into first-tier colleges. And, you know, the ripple effect for that is significant. You're not only looking at their earning potential, you're looking at their ability to contribute financially both to the state of Maine and also to this town. And so I would urge you to reconsider the budget. Thank you very much. Oh, hello. Oh, there is no clapping. There are rules decorum. You'll see them right up here on the board. There's no clapping. There's no personalities. Otherwise, we'll, we'll be here all, all night and not get anything actually achieved. So um, again, you do have your name. You have your address. You have three minutes to speak. I'm at 54. There you go. Mike Turek, 11 Bayberry Lane. I'm pretty sure that most of the council has already made up their minds on the budget, and no one will be swayed by what is said in comments tonight. Still, I would speak because I think it needs to be said. Today, 22% of approximately one in five Scarborough residents live on less than $35,000 a year. One in five Mainers is over 65. By 2030, that number will grow to 25% or one in four. 
Not all of them will be affluent. Most will be average people who worked hard all their adult lives to make ends meet. Some are now in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. In their 20s and 30s, they raised families. Perhaps the American dream of buying a home with a mortgage came to fruition in their 30s or 40s. A home equity loan or a line of credit became necessary along the way to pay for things needed but not covered by the paycheck. By the time they were of the official retirement age of 65, they know they will not be able to retire. If they do retire, they must, make, must take a part-time job to make ends meet. I personally know that because I had to do it. I still work part-time. We've heard and read stories of people in this particular age group struggling to make ends meet. There is a constant battle to pay the bills, which increase more rapidly than Social Security. IRAs and pensions help, but they do not increase yearly. Property taxes are the one thing that increase faster than anything else. One day the re realization sets in. It's time to delay a visit to the doctor. It's time to make a decision to get more medication or get more food. It's time to decide which medications you can skip or cut in half. I often hear arguments that increasing property taxes increases community value and makes house prices go up. When people do decide to sell their house, they get a huge return on their investment. There was such an argument in the Scarborough Leader last week. But what about those people I mentioned earlier? They don't want to sell their house and move. They bought the house through the years of struggle. This is where they want to grow old gracefully and die with dignity. Let's remember them before we go ahead and raise the taxes. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Carrie Goulder. I'm at 10 Thomas Drive. Um, with all due respect, I do believe that that almost sounds like we need a better education here in Scarborough to prevent that from happening to our children in their futures. Um, my daughters were accepted into the Gates program for arts. They're sitting there drawing in their art pads right now because that's what they do. That's what they eat, sleep, and breathe. But in the town of Scarborough, they don't, they don't get independent study. They won't get an advanced coursework. It says it right here on the paperwork. All they're going to get is maybe a little classroom consultation, differenti differentiated instruction within the classroom. But the Gates math students, they're going to go and they're going to excel. They're going to have differentiated classroom instruction if the budget's not cut. Um, my daughters won't get that. A lot of kids won't get that. They are in the top 5% of art achievement in the town of Scarborough, in the state, actually. They both are. But they're not going to be able to continue excelling and doing what they were made to do and, and achieving their, their talents without the proper budget because it's all being taken away. Last year, my daughter was told when she got into sixth grade, you will have an extra class. You're going to have a Gates program. There wasn't one in Wentworth. We know that. But she's going to have one when she gets to middle school. Guess what? We got to middle school, and there was no program because there was no budget for it. I had to fight so hard to get her something. And so what they did is they said, you can go into an extra classroom during your rise period. You can go sit in the art classroom. Great. And do what? The teacher was there as, a, as an adult support. There was no differentiated instructions available to her. A whole year wasted. I would ask you and beg you to reconsider the budget. It's not high enough. You are taking away all these children's education and their potential futures. Thank you. Lexi Jamison, 14 Carryman Circle. Um, I'm a rising senior at Scarborough High School, a student athlete playing soccer and lacrosse, as well as an active member in my school's key club and civil rights team, and a member of the Wind Ensemble Band at SHS. For those of you who may not know, Key Club is an international student-led service organization sponsored by Qantas. Throughout my three years at SHS, I have been a devoted member of this club. This past spring, I had the honor of being elected as the New England and Bermuda District Governor of Key Club International, which essentially means that I oversee all of the key clubs in New England and Bermuda. I have had the privilege of connecting with people from all over the world that share a similar passion for service and helping others. 
Key Club is the largest club at Scarborough High School with over 120 members. The core values of this organization, caring, inclusiveness, leadership, and character building speak for themselves. I joined Key Club as a shy and naive freshman entering high school, not really sure where my place was. Throughout Key Club, I've learned endless amounts about myself and leadership, allowing myself to develop into a mature and confident young adult. <laughs> Each year, our members participate in community service projects that are planned solely by our own club officers and members. Cutting this program from our school will mean that over 6,000 hours of service per year to our community here in Scarborough will be lost. Our most successful project every year is a day of leaf raking for the senior citizens in Scarborough that are not capable of doing so themselves. Last fall, 58 members participated in this event, completing almost 500 hours of service in one day. In addition to the local service that we do, the SHS Key Club has also contributed to organizations in which we have worked with families who have lost children to terminal illnesses, um, provided assistance for children who have suffered terrible illness terrible injuries, raise money to help provide shelter and schooling for orphan children in Vietnam, as well as vaccinations for mothers and babies suffering from maternal and neonatal tetanus. Cutting Key Club from our school isn't just the loss of a club. It's the loss of a place where people learn, grow, and develop themselves into competent young adults. It's the loss of thousands of hours of service to our community. It's the loss of future friendships to be made, and the loss of hundreds of opportunities offered to its members. However, it's not just all about Key Club. I hope you can see how much the students of SHS are learning and growing through Key Club and how much we're doing, but that's what every club and program at Scarborough is about. These clubs are where students learn to express themselves through doing what they love. They teach drive, initiative, and passion, and without these clubs and programs, the students at Scarborough High School are merely just that, students. Thank you, and please consider this when reviewing the budget. Hi, my name is Karen Freem. I was a former Scarborough teacher. I now teach in Portland Public Schools. Um, I want to talk about professional development. I just came back from a um, model schools conference in Atlanta that Portland Public Schools sponsored me to go to, and one of the things that came up with the model schools is that we needed to get kids in the 21st century. We need to get our schools in the 21st century. Now, how do we do that? We look at um, what's happening right now. If we look at 40% of our population in the United States between the age of 18 and 65, it does not have a full-time job. So about 25%, there's a man, Bill Daggett, who spoke about this, and this is all accurate, about 25% of the population is supporting. Um, about the 40% is taking in from our government and taking in from, and what's happening is everyone wants to blame it on the government, but you've got to look at our schools. Our schools are in 20th century. Our schools need to be 21st century. Our teachers need to know that and understand that, and that's why I'm talking about professional development. Our teachers need that, and I see that that's cut on the budget, and that makes me really sad because I teach in Portland, and we get amazing amount of professional development. And I, you know, I think Scarborough needs that as well, um, and the teachers are willing. I'm confused, though, with the budget when we start cutting things such as theater and the professional development, and, and we lose that. Because our students, the reason that 40% is not getting the jobs is that jobs are get, they're getting them from overseas. Kids from overseas and other educational backgrounds are getting those jobs. Our kids are not. They're not prepared. They're not collaborating. They're not using technology. They're not um, researching and using all those things. And the teachers then, if we teach the teachers, if we continue with the professional development for the teachers, that will then in, in fact affect the children. And so I ask you, I beg you, please, this budget, you need to look back at this budget and you need to add more to this budget and keep the things to get our kids ready for 21st century, to get them into the workforce so that 40% of our, our, our um, population is not being supported, <coughs> so that it's more than 25% than that's supporting everyone else. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jacqueline Perry. I reside at 215 Black Point Road. I am, am a member of the Board of Education and have been off and on since 1977. I am neither a liar nor a cheat. In fact, people who know me will say, Jackie, tell us what you mean, really. <laughs> because I usually say what is on my mind. 
Members of the Board of Education and our administrators are not liars or cheats, and the implication that we are hiding money is insulting to us and to those of you implying it. All right, folks, well, please, please. I, I, get, we have to get through the meeting. Re reset Jackie's timer for a minute. Folks, I'm, I'm going to remind everyone that there is rules of decorum. If we can't behave as a group and like adults and be respectful of that, there is no applause, there is no insults. The, you know, there are rules to how we speak, we can conduct ourselves. If we can't behave, I will have to shut down the comment section. So again, please keep in mind, be respectful that, yes, although you are very happy with her opinion, there are other opinions as well. So go, go ahead and did you reset her? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'll give you an extra couple minutes, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. We are trying to educate our students in six buildings with over 525 full-time employees. That does not count coaches. It does not count advisors. Those are full-time employees. We have more than 24 buses on the road every day. We have to pay utilities. We have to pay lights. We have to pay uh, multiple things just as we do in our homes. And I admit those costs do go up. We have answered every question asked of this board about this budget. But I am tired of counselors telling me it doesn't matter when I try and explain something to them. Doesn't feel good. We are now being accused of inciting the parents and the public because we will have to eliminate some activities and some athletics. <laughs> but what are our choices? I'm a Kiwani, and you think I want to give up Key Club? I helped start the Key Club in this town. But we have to choose classroom teachers over everything else. That's our mission. That's what we have to do. So when you look at the school budget compared to the town budget, keep in mind the number of staff, buildings, equipment, etc. And don't forget, community services could not function without the school's facilities. Here is a quote some of you may have received from a counselor. Certainly it is out of context. While the 800000 plus increase in GPA money is indeed earmarked for schools, please remember that even if we had had this money in May, it would not have meant the council would have given the schools anything more than what is necessary to fund the essential services of the schools. In effect, the council loaned those monies to the schools in the interim with the understanding that the town council would then get that money back if it were allocated as it has been. I have never heard of such a thing, a town lending money to the school department to run its schools. Jackie, you this is a it. good town, and our schools are a major part of our existence. Ms. Perry, you are out of time, if you could wrap up. Thank you. That was with a few extra minutes, too. <laughs> schools and children matter. Thank you. Good evening. My name is David Cleary. I live on Meeting House Road with my wife, Jennifer. We have three sons who are entering 8th, 9th, and 11th grades. I voted yes just right on the first referendum vote. I voted no too low on the second. When we moved to Scarborough in 2004 from Massachusetts, we had some familiarity with taxes. We have narrowed our choices down to Scarborough and Falmouth. The key factors in our decision were the quality of the schools and the local real estate market. We chose Scarborough because the school system was strong and the real estate provided a better value for us. One thing I urge the council and members of this community to keep in mind is that Scarborough is in competition, competing for residents that become taxpayers and part of the local economic engine upon which we all rely and benefit from. When young families choose a community in which to live, over time they are bringing tens of thousands of dollars in local property tax revenue 
and buying products and services that support local businesses who also pay taxes. Every resident or family that chooses somewhere else <coughs> other than Scarborough in which to live represents a potential significant economic loss. But this loss isn't felt all at once. When a beach erodes, it usually does so over time, little by little, mostly unnoticed to the casual viewer. Like a beach, taxpayer erosion doesn't happen overnight. It happens slowly over time, creeping up until one day the damage could be irreparable. The difference between the first and the second referendums when that was an average taxpayer savings of $45 a year, or 12.3 cents a day. And the cost to this mostly insignificant savings is further erosion to the educational experience of our young people, further erosion to the attractiveness of Scarborough as a place to choose to live and to choose to raise a family. In the last 10 years or so, it's my understanding, Scarborough's state school ranking has slipped from a high of number, number four to number 11 today. <laughs> erosion. Last year in this same budget quandary, one result was the elimination of programs including all seventh grade athletics. Erosion. Our community is worth more than 12 cents a day. I urge this council to restore the $500,000 spending reduction and for the residents of Scarborough to vote yes to strong schools and to a strong community. Vote to prevent further erosion and to continue to make Scarborough a desirable and attractive place to live and work for years to come. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jenny Jubilis. Um, I live at 16 Haystack Circle in Scarborough with my husband and my almost four-year-old preschool aged daughter. Um, to be honest, I did not plan on speaking tonight. Um, public speaking is pretty much my worst nightmare, but when I left the house, I told my daughter that I was going to go fight for her schools, and so that is what I'm here to do. This is something about which I am passionate, and this is the first time I have ever done this. While my child has another year before starting kindergarten, it frightens me that in any year, school funding could be cut in such a detrimental way, impacting both her and other children, as well as our community. School is certainly the classroom, but it is far more than that, and programs such as band, chorus, theater, clubs, and sports are a lifeline for many of our children, particularly as they reach their middle school and high school years. Opportunities such as these are essential to growth, and failure to fund these programs adequately will likely only result in increased spending for dealing with kids after school as they find other, less productive ways to occupy their time while shortchanging their education and personal growth. I am a product of public schools, as is my husband, and both of us have gone, gone on to lead successful professional lives. However, we are very concerned about the way the schools are headed for our daughter. I certainly appreciate the concerns raised by taxpayers living on a fixed income regarding raising of property taxes. And I do believe that some form of tax relief is in order for those that truly need it. However, to cut our school budget to pacify individuals who have no children in school currently is to negate the purpose of public services. As I'm sure many have pointed out in numerous letters, we continue to fund other public services such as roads, libraries, parks, and the fire department, which may not be used by all because these are vital for our community's well-being. Schools are another vital force in our community, and excellent schools improve all of our lives, increasing property values, bringing young families to the area and improving the tax base, educating our youth, and hopefully driving the future economy forward, as was mentioned by the first speaker. I am relatively new to the area and, to be honest, did not understand until this year that the school budget is the only budget that comes under such public scrutiny, and I join other voices in supporting enhanced transparency and public questioning of other budgets, rather than fo focusing all economizing on the schools. In conclusion, while I'm from away, my family and I have grown to love this community we now call home. It makes me happy that my daughter will attend an ex school in an excellent school system with children from our neighborhood and will have opportunities in school I likely cannot even imagine. We moved to Scarborough of all the communities in the area in large part for the schools, and I urge the town council to strongly consider families such as mine with young children who have their entire school tenure in front of them as they seek to reconcile this difficult issue. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Kim Gambardella, and I live at 6 Howard Lane. I have three kids in the school system, uh, a second grader, a fifth grader, and a seventh grader. And my husband and I have been talking to our kids about this budget process. We took them to vote. We talked about how, um, how we voted, why. We've let them read some of the articles in local papers and really tried to involve them as much as possible, knowing that they will be directly impacted 
by the outcome. My nine-year-old daughter wanted to come here tonight and speak to you all. Unfortunately, she's away at overnight camp in Ellsworth, and it was not possible for her to be here, so she wrote a letter that she asked me to read. This is all in her own words. My name is Lauren Gambardella. I was hoping this didn't happen. <laughs> okay, my name is Lauren Gambardella, and I am nine years old and going into fifth grade at Wentworth School. I love school, and I love to make friends at clubs and sports teams. I love chorus, and I've done it for two years. Before, I didn't know that I loved to sing, but I was good at it. And I'm lucky that I got to sing at the Wentworth opening ceremony and the school concert. I'd be really sad if this was taken away. I was excited to do theater club next year, but I might not be able to because of the cuts in the budget. That makes me very sad. I have a big brother named Ryan Gamardella. He's 11 years old and going into seventh grade. He loves sports, and he would be disappointed if it all got cut. My family would be disappointed, too, because he's an amazing player. <laughs> I don't want him to lose out on this opportunity. I also have a little brother named Kyle Gamardella, and he's seven and will be going into second grade. I want him to have the same fun experiences that my big brother and I have had at Wentworth. I love Scarborough and my friends and my teachers and my school. Us kids are important to the world and to the future of this community. I know I'm only nine, but I hope my words are important. A lot of people, including me and my family, will be really sad if these programs were cut. Sincerely, Lauren Gambardella. So I voted too no, no too low on July 7th for the children of Scarborough, and I was thankful to see that many others did, and that vote won. Education in our town is not the place to cut. We have not restored many of the programs that have been cut over the past several years, and our kids should not have to see more. They need to have these opportunities to grow as people, both in the classroom and out of the classroom. And as my daughter said, they are the future of this community. So I'm asking you to listen to the voters of Scarborough, the voters that by majority think the budget was too low. Please support our schools, our children, and education in our town by restoring the full school budget. Thank you. My name is Josh Cazzo. I live on 17 Elmwood Avenue in Scarborough, Maine. I'm a senior at Scarborough High School, and I have been a participant in extracurricular activities involving the school since fifth grade. This first activity being the Wentworth Civil Rights Club, I swam on the middle school swim team and continued my commitment through to senior year. I've also been a participant in extracurricular music activities since seventh grade. I've also recently been accepted into the Gates Music Program as of two days ago. These have included Jazz Combo, Jazz Lab, and Jazz Ensemble. I've also participated in the Jazz Choir Rhythm Section. These programs have given me the opportunity to expand my peer group as well as meet new teachers and students. The spirit of the swim team has taught me perseverance and the team mentality has given me a taste of group dependency. These values express themselves in my daily activities, which I doubt they would without the experience of the high school team. I believe that every student that is involved in extracurricular activities agrees with me, that the bond of a team and the virtue of perseverance experienced has positively affected their lives. Cutting these programs from the school would do the opposite, in fact, in affect the students negatively by removing these values from their lives, values that many adults may take for granted. I believe that the money cut from the school budget should be placed back into the school funding in order to give every student the chance to experience a well-rounded education and teach them important lessons taught in after-school activities. My name is Justin Chiazzo. I live on 17 Emlet Avenue, Scarborough, Maine. Being an incoming freshman, I have the choice to participate in all of these new extracurricular activities. Now because of the budget cuts, my opportunities to participate in more activities that high schoolers had before are now threatened to be downsized to a dramatically smaller amount. Having a brother who has been through three years of high school, I have watched him go through the clubs that I wished to go through when I was in middle school, like the several kinds of jazz band groups. Music is just as important to me and several of my friends as it is to my brother, and I always thought that I would have the same opportunities that he had through his three years. The last thing I'd like to say is, I am one of the many students who are watching to see how this plays out and hoping to learn lessons from this conflict. Please consider what are the priorities of our town and the future of my classmates. Thank you. Michelle Arpin, 9 Coulthard Farms Road. I'm here to speak in support of returning level services funding for the school budget and respectfully request that all counselors will, one, honor the vote on July 7th. At the June 17th council meeting, Councillor Hayes said the following, quote, 
We were elected to be here to represent all of you out there in the audience, but we have to be thinking about doing what our community, what does the majority of our community want. I think it was pretty clear with the referendum that went out that the majority of our community told us this budget is too high. They expect some type of adjustment. I think our accountability, our responsibility is to listen. That's what we're supposed to do. <clears throat> we're your elected officials. And the beauty of the way we do this, just as, when, just as we went out with a budget that voters told us was too high, they certainly have an option this time, if we don't get it dialed in right, to tell us that it's too low. The last referendum did voice a majority opinion that the budget was too low. I hope all counselors will listen to this vote just as you did after June 9th. Two, please reconsider your vote regarding the use of newly acquired state funds and allow a portion of these funds to be used to support a level services school budget. I am a school nurse in a nearby district. For some, my job may discredit anything else I am about to say. However, I ask that you listen for a minute. As a school nurse, I am privileged to witness and participate in experiences both inside the classroom and school-wide. I see amazing teaching and learning, especially when a teacher gets creative beyond curriculum requirements, such as an online Iditarod tracking project that incorporated social studies, math, and a real-world experience. On the flip side, I see the impact of state education mandates and inadequate school funding, which impact the entire district down to each individual classroom. There are special education students and the significant resources required to meet their needs. Then there are the students who do not meet special ed requirements but still need help and resources, scarce resources, to meet proficiency standards. The effects of larger class sizes often resulting in increased school nurse visits for stomach aches and headaches related to feeling anxious or overwhelmed in large classrooms. And the impact on staff that are constantly being asked to give and perform more with fewer resources and greater demands. They also visit my office for some Tylenol to treat a headache or even an ice pack and TLC for a physical injury that occurred in a special education environment that had gotten out of hand. So why tell you all this? I hope my comments will echo, echo Councillor Donovan's on June 17th when he said the school budget increase is not due to excessive spending. And finally, long-term issues. I respectfully request the town council to develop a tax assistance program for those in need of financial assistance and develop a plan to unite the municipal and school budgets into one budget. In doing so, the entire town will share the benefits of local revenue and the burden of revenue shortfalls from the state. If we can unite the budgets, maybe then we can move forward with less finger pointing, emotional discord, and division. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christy Cassio. I live at 10 Howard Lane. My husband and I moved to Scarborough seven years ago for the purpose of providing a greater educational opportunity for our young children. My children are now 13 and 10 and attend Scarborough Middle School and the Wentworth Intermediate School. They have already had the misfortune of losing valuable programs at their respective schools. My for my daughter, it was foreign language, and for my son, it was seventh grade sports. And now we are facing even more significant cuts to valuable educational and extracurricular programs. I can tell you from the perspective of being a parent of a child that is truly motivated to do well in school so that he can play sports, these kinds of programs matter. Not only do these activities provide motivation for children, whether they are, are athletic programs, theater, chorus, or the math team, they teach valuable life skills. These programs provide leadership skills that they will carry with them into their adulthood, as well as promote teamwork and many other valuable skills that we need to see more in our future generation. It's such a shame for a town like Scarborough that has drawn so many families to this great community, which has in turn increased all of our property values, to see this continued decline in our public education. We need to stop taking from our children and start looking closer at our municip municipal excuse me, budget to see where we can make some reductions. Would we rather see new trees planted in the middle of our roads and beach <coughs> signs created for our community, or would we rather put those funds into the investment of our future generations? To me, the answer seems so simple, yet we continue to have this same discussion year over year. The numbers don't lie and the voters have spoken. This budget that was brought to voters on July 7th is just too low. Good evening, Council. My name is Karam Durda. I live 
on Six Haystack Circle and I have three kids uh, in the school system. And uh, for me, uh, the issue is broken into three tranches. One is your moral obligation. You have a moral obligation to approve a budget that educates our kids. It's simple. You have been elected to uphold certain things as an office member, and one of them is a moral obligation for the well-being of the citizens of this town. This budget is way damn too low. And the reason is because I urge you to be creative about things. You need to be creative about the obligation and the responsibility that you have to me, my kids, and all these people around here. So keep that in mind. Second thing is your fiscal obligation. Other than the erosion that's mentioned, you have an obligation from a fiscal point of view to ensure that the kids who graduate from the school are hireable. I've spent many, many years on the USM board, and I hire a fair amount of kids in Maine. And I can assure you, the standard of the Scarborough kids coming out are lower, which means their earning power at some point will be lower, which means they will not come back here in the numbers that you may want them to, which means they are not going to be productive citizens that you or I or the rest of the parents over here may want them to be. So you have a fiscal obligation to that. You also have a governance obligation, for God's sake. You have an obligation to be able to take those two budgets and not make them a zero-sum game. You need to make it, make it a win-win. I don't care if you guys don't want to pick up my trash and my recycling. I'd gladly give that up. You don't want to sweep my streets? I'll do it. I'll pay the kids to do that and make them productive members. You want to be able to negotiate in good faith and fully transparent order to enable a budget that works. And speaking of governance, yes, we should have tax relief. And that tax relief should be negotiated and do it transparently. If you don't trust these guys to do their jobs, can them. If you don't trust the superintendent to come and give you recommendations or the teachers or the Board of Education, get rid of them. But don't be duplicitous about it. Don't carve this town out into us and them because you are unable to satisfy and fulfill your responsibility and obligation as elected town councils. So do me a favor. Make me proud. Don't let me come over here and fight a war that is not worth fighting because if it's a zero-sum game you have in mind, I will leave. Thank you. My name is Drew Stevens. I'm at 6 Surrey Lane. I've got this really nice speech, but there's two things I have to mention since we've been in here. Um, order number 15049, public hearing, blah, 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 blah. Councillor Blaze said, the committee looked at it, said it's okay. Everyone goes, yeah, it's great, it's okay. For now on, it needs to be, how's it going to affect the school budget next time? Every single thing that the town looks at. There's more people outside there that you can't see. That room is full. I haven't been to every meeting for five years, but I've been to over 20 meetings. I've never seen this many people. And they're all here because they voted too low, and they want you to hear our voice. So with that being said, thank you for the opportunity for letting me speak. I'm going to start with a quote from the June 17th town council meeting. We all have our personal opinions, but we were elected to represent all of you out there in the audience. What we have to be thinking is what does our community, what does the majority of our community want? I think it was made clear by the referendum that went out that the majority of our community told us this budget is too high. They expect some type of adjustment, our accountability, our responsibility to listen. That's what we're supposed to do. We're your elected officials. Having said that, I think the 350, referring to the $350,000 drop, is a starting point. I think that people, when they went to the polls, were looking for more than a half percent adjustment. And the beauty of doing this is just as we went out with a budget that voters told us was too high, they certainly have an option this time if we don't get it dialed in right to tell us that it's too low. Direct quote not paraphrasing. I think our constituency, the majority of them, feel differently. And I really take offense when we start to divide our community and say we don't like children, or some people don't support children. We're all a community. It's a community resource. 
you should get to decide where you want to spend your resources. I think we need to listen to you. This is a direct verbatim quote from Councillor Hayes, and when he refers to his constituency, he loses me. I thought all people of Scarborough are your constituency, not just the ones with the same ideology. And for, as far as dividing our town, I don't believe people who refer to those of us supporting strong schools as blank checkers are using a fair or accurate depiction, do you? If you don't, as a town councilor, you should be calling them out. You should be trying to find common ground, like you said in your wonderful speech on June 17th. And remember, we just want to keep a certain standard for our schools, period, that's it. No one here is advocating for additional millions of dollars to go into our schools. The people who don't like paying taxes are arguing for an ideology that is unreasonable. You put the budget out, they voted no. You lowered it by 500,000, they voted no. You're not gonna win with that group unless you're going to lower it by millions of dollars. Sorry, that you're I'll be wrapping up in a five to 10 seconds. So I ask you, does every vote count the same? Because if so, I'm not gonna throw out a bunch of numbers and statistics, but on June 9th, 20% of the town voted with a 311 person majority you interpreted that as a $500,000 reduction. On July 7th, 26% of the town, a larger number by over 900 people voted, with a 209 majority to say it was too low. Same people, more people actually. Using your logic, that means we should go back up to at least 500,000 more than where you're at right now. We're the majority, we're not going away, and we have Republicans and Democrats and old people and young people and parents and grandparents and people with no kids in our schools who are all here tonight Sir, to say it's too low. You're, you're out of time. We hope you continue to do what you're doing in the right way and give us a real school budget that we can work with. So just so everybody knows, the green light obviously is go. When you see the yellow light, that it flashes at you that you have 30 seconds and then the red light means that the three minutes is up. My name is uh, Andy Maller. I live at 39 Gunstock Road. I'm an 11-year resident of Scarborough with two kids in the school district. And unfortunately, the past few years, Scarborough's school budget vote has turned into more of a referendum on our property tax bill and less about what services our schools should be, should be providing. Unfairly, the only way for some town residents to express their frustrations with the higher property tax is to vote the school budget down. It's unjust to make the school budget the scapegoat for higher taxes. The original school budget was for level services. There was nothing elaborate proposed, nothing sinister was planned, nothing unfair, nothing, un nothing excessive, level services. <coughs> yes, taxes were gonna go up. Every surrounding town has a tax rate that was gonna go up. There are 12 coastal towns running from Bitterford to Brunswick. And Scarborough has the third lowest mill rate of all these towns. From where I'm standing, third lowest is pretty darn good. Nothing in the level services budget was going to change that. The town council has done a good job in the past in balancing the needs of our schools with the needs of keeping our taxes in check. Nothing in level services changes that. Level services is fair. Level service services is just. Level services is what everybody in red tonight is demanding. I'm hoping for your support, but more importantly, I'm looking for your leadership as elected town officials in, town, in changing the narrative that has defined our school budget vote the last few years. Please support Level Services. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cindy Kuick. I live at Six Moors Point Road. Uh, several years ago, my husband lost his job. He was furloughed for six months. When that happened, we did what any family would do. We reevaluated our budget. We looked at what our income was, and we looked at what our expenses were. And we made adjustments based on that. Some things we cut out, we cut cable, we stopped eating out, we only bought used clothes instead of new clothes. Some things we negotiated, we called our insurance companies and got lower car and homeowners insurance, we changed our phone plans. 
Um, we decided we needed more income, and so we sold some things. I picked up a second job and worked more hours. My husband did odd jobs while he was looking for a full-time job. During that time, some other expenses went up. Our oil went up, gasoline went up, taxes, groceries, and so we had to constantly evaluate our expenses and our income and see what we had to do to cover everything. <coughs> I think you can kind of see where I'm going with this analogy. Year after year, we've been losing money from the state, and so we have to reevaluate our budgets. We have to make some cuts, we have to find some more income, and we have to find that good balance. When my husband and I were going through our scenario, one thing we didn't do was look at one category in our budget and make cuts only to that. So I didn't say to my husband, you know what, you lost your job, so you're going to make all the sacrifices. You're going to give up your car, you're going to give up your toys. We as a family decided to absorb those things and work with it together. But that's what's happening in our town. We're losing money from the state for the school, and so everybody is saying, well, we're going to make budgets, uh, cuts to the school budget, because guess what? That's the only place that this town has a voice, is in that school budget. And that's not really fair. Would we ever say to the police or the fire department, you know what, you guys lost money, you got to absorb all those costs. you got to make that cut, and you got to suck it up. We would never do that. Um, I don't expect this town to raise my kids. I don't think anybody else here does. I volunteer in the classroom. I buy supplies. I give money to the PTA. I volunteer outside the classroom, and I pay for additional activities. I don't expect the taxpayers to do those things for me. But there are some things that are irreplaceable. After school activities, chorus, theater, Lego robotics, the news program after school. There's nowhere else for me to go for my kids to have those opportunities. We've reached the basement. We can't keep cutting from the schools. And so what we need to do is find a way to spread the burden throughout the town. I'd like us to see us become a community again, be a community united and not divided. As a family, we absorbed the losses that we had and we made it work. As a town, I'd really like to see us absorb those losses together and make it work and not just constantly penalize the school department. I'd like to see the budget come back. Thank you. My name is Megan Nathanson. I live on 24 Windsor Pines Drive. I am a captain of the girls' tennis team. I would like to discourage you from cutting the tennis program as well as the other sports and clubs at risk of being cut, like Ecos and Key Club. Sports and clubs define Scarborough students and community. Throughout my high school years, I have had the pleasure of being on both the tennis and cheerleading team. As a freshman, I immediately made friendships and connections with other students because of these sports that have been vital to my success throughout the years. In addition, these sports taught me time management skills that can only be learned through experience. Balancing both practice and schoolwork is a difficult thing to do, but it is a skill that needs to be learned in order to be successful in life. Lastly, these cuts make it difficult for students who would like to play sports in college to be recruited. Please realize that these cuts will negatively affect students for the rest of their lives. Thank you. Right. Seth Jackson, 378 Black Point Road. President, Class of 2016, President, Model of the United Nations. I am a product of Scarborough Schools. They've made me the person that I am today. All the clubs and sports I've participated in which includes swimming, tennis, band, jazz band, interact club, and many more, have shaped me into the model student that I am today. The camaraderie and friendships that have resulted from these clubs and sports are the pinnacle of what this board and this town wants for our students. The experience I have had will not be obtainable by future generations of students in Scarborough if this budget remains unchanged. I urge you on behalf of the class of 2016 and members of the Model, Nine, Model United Nations, invest in your students. They are the future. Thank you. Hi, I'm Hillary Durgan, 9 Sequoia Lane. A fully funded school system is important not only for our children's education, but also our property values and our sense of community. As difficult it is, as it has been for me to consider cutting half a million dollars from our school's budget, I do feel that there has been just one benefit. 
It has broken through the unfortunate voter apathy that has existed in Scarborough for the past several years. The tide has turned. People have come out and voted, and they have told you that this budget is too low. I ask you to look carefully at the most recent vote on July 7th. I have heard some councillors are calling this vote essentially a tie. I cannot agree with that. Not only did the two low win the popular vote, but it also increased by 150% over the June 9th vote. The two high vote went down by 20%. Previously, many councillors have used the voice of the voters as justification for reducing the school budget. Now is your chance to look at the popular vote and the increase in people who feel the budget is too low and use it as justification to add funding to the schools. In light of the additional and unexpected funding from the state, I hope to see you restore $500,000 to the school budget. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hugh Morganbesser, and I live at Two Hope Lane here in Scarborough, Maine. Actually, I prepared a few different notes, but uh, I'm going to start just uh, taking a few moments to, first of all, just be grateful for this amazing turnout tonight and the different things that people have said and I've gotten to hear tonight. Uh, what an, I knew I lived in an amazing community and tonight actually really reinforced um, how many people here love uh, to live in Scarborough and how many great things are happening here. So, um, the, uh, you know, I, I I, uh, actually, I've been doing a lot of uh, gratitude exercises re recently, and it's just amazingly powerful uh, to uh, take some time to be grateful. And um, I'm really grateful for the fact that I get to have a voice here, even if I'm already stumbling on my words, and to listen to everyone here. And um, I'm really grateful for the education that I received growing up and for the opportunities that it gave me uh, as an adult and uh, for the joy that it's brought into my life. I love uh, arts and learning and books and mathematics and sports and music and camaraderie and friendships and all of the great things that are so much more important of and so, so much more important to me and uh, the happiness and the community that it's so uh, short-sighted, of course, and it's very cliche, but it's so important to say how important our schools are for the happiness and the health and the, the goodness that we have here, what a great opportunity we have to really invest in the, our future here. And I'm so grateful to see so many wonderful people coming out tonight and sharing their stories and their voices. And I'm grateful for your ears and listening and hearing that it's, it's not okay for us to, uh, to shortchange ourselves. Uh, there are so many great things that people have already said, so I won't say them all again, except I will take one more time to uh, be grateful for uh, this opportunity for the color red, for No Too Low, for our uh, property and our beautiful Scarborough town and sunshine and fresh air and uh, for laughter <laughs> and, um, and for the opportunity we have to do the right thing for our kids and our neighbor's kids and our friend's kids and the people we don't even know their kids and the people who don't have kids so that they can live in a great place too. Uh, thank you again, and uh, have a great night. Hi, Amy Colton, to Hope Lane. As a staff member of the Scarborough Schools and as a parent of two young children attending Eight Corner School next year, I have been following the school budget product process pretty closely. While I have been heartened by the number of taxpayers who have spoken up for increasing the school budget, I have serious concerns about the future of next year's budget as well as the budget in years to come. It is short-sighted to have our school system work with anything less than a level services budget each year. Cutting the school budget to reduce services at all, ever, is irresponsible. The quality of the schools and the experiences of each child within them are the most important influences on the future of Scarborough and the world we will all live in tomorrow. If the quality of our schools declines, we will see many families moving out of Scarborough, property values decrease, and then the quality of our schools further decreases, and so on in a downward cycle. I believe that the Town Council has the ability to make significant changes in the culture surrounding the school budget. The insidious belief that the school budget is equal to increased taxes is problematic, to say the least. This belief must change for us to keep current in the world of education and to produce educated, thoughtful citizens who believe they can make the world a better place. The tasks you have before you are to follow the majority of the voters 
and to do the right thing for the town. Fortunately, in this case, the two are not mutually exclusive. I am asking you to put the recently cut $500,000 back into the school budget. I imagine this will feel like a strange thing to do given that the budget failed in June. However, I think that the voting majority would like it put back in. If it does not get put back in, the budget may again fail and be deemed too low by a majority. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Robin Twombly. I live at 29 Pondview Drive. And um, I am a prosecutor by trade, so speaking in front of people is something I've done my whole career. <laughs> but I moved here um, three years ago with my husband, and I now sell golf shirts. So I'm not <laughs> quite the uh, hard-nosed prosecutor that I used to be. But I was born and raised in the suburbs of Philadelphia, and I was lucky enough to get a great education, obviously a law degree. And um, my husband's from Maine. So we moved here three years ago, and if I'm being honest, the last place I wanted to be was in Maine. Um, but I've grown to love it here and love everything about Maine and the way of life that is Maine and Scarborough. We just bought a house last year. We waited a long time to make the right decision. We looked into Falmouth and Cape Elizabeth and all of the places people tell you to look at for schools. But we chose Scarborough, and we chose Scarborough because of the beautiful opportunities that are here, and we chose Scarborough because of the um, property values and the family-oriented area. And most importantly, we chose Scarborough because in talking to so many people, we were assured that our son, who's going to be in third grade, would get a great education and that Scarborough was second to none and that you got more bang for the buck and you didn't need to be in Falmouth. You didn't need to be in Cape Elizabeth to get that opportunity. And then I see what's happened. And that blows me away. Um, I've never seen this in the Philadelphia area. Education has always been the top priority. There was never fighting. There was never battles on Facebook and newspapers about the basic fundamental principle that every child is entitled to a great education. And the fact that all these people are here tonight, most of which I do not know, um, <laughs> but they feel the same way. And, and it baffles me and it saddens me and it angers me all at the same time that this is even an issue, that we're here. I specialized in child abuse prosecution for 12 years, and I saw the differences that were made in children who had sports that they could throw themselves into, arts, theater, clubs, all of these things, and the fact that that would just be taken away for no reason. And it just makes me very sad, and I hope that you look around this room to all these people and you realize that kids are the most important thing. And if you can't get behind education, you can't get behind kids, then maybe you shouldn't be on the council. Thank you. Uh, my name is Scott Furr. I live at 16 Old Colony Lane. Um, I have my three children here who are all in the Scarborough school system. I think um, I, I want to thank all of you for your hard work in this divisive issue. I think the real enemy here is voter apathy. I've said that from day one three years ago, and I continue to say it. And this last vote, all three of my children and my wife, we went door to door, and we made sure people went out and voted. And I guarantee that every vote from now on, year after year, we will be out there getting people to vote because I think that's our real enemy. And I want to encourage everyone here to encourage your neighbors to vote. I don't care how you vote. I just want you to vote. We need this town to be responsible and speak up for not only our students but everyone. And we can't do that if we have voter turnouts of 10 or 15 percent. So I want to encourage you guys to um, fund the schools properly, and I will do my part and get people out to vote. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Katie Foley, Three Lucky Lane. Um, I'm going to go out, out on a little bit of a limb here and uh, venture a guess that very few people would switch seats with you tonight. I don't envy your position whatsoever, um, and yet um, I respect your positions and all of the hard work that have, has gone into the last two referendum processes. Um, I've kept pretty silent on the school budget issue in part because I was away for much of the beginning of the process, um, but also because I am tired of the divisive nature and negative energy that seems to surround our town politics. Have we listened to ourselves tonight? I mean, have we really listened to ourselves? I still hear people flinging insults 
at school board members, at town councilors, at neighbors who may support the budget or, or support you know, whichever side of the argument they're on, this is not the kind of town that I want to live in. Um, and I just feel like uh, we all own that. This is not town council's responsibility. It's not the school board's responsibility. It's our town. And what kind of town do you want to live in? Um, what I have heard, and I can't verify it, um, but through this process we have had threatening emails sent to counselors. We've had fecal matter placed on citizens' uh, lawn and mailbox. Um, and, and everybody has a right to their opinion. I'm not going to tell you how I voted, um, but I will tell you this. I've worked for 20 years supporting kids, and I've worked with superintendents all over the state, and I've worked on behalf of students as an advocate. So if I vote against a budget because I think it's too high, it may be because there are other reasons behind it. Um, there's a process problem here. And that is very clear and apparent. And we do need to do better, and we can do better. So I say we start that, as soon as we get through this, in September. Let's work together instead of at each other. Um, so you've, guys got, you've got a tough job. The first vote was a resounding no and indicated that the budget was way too high. The majority in the second vote also said no, way too low. Um, but the qualifier was a bit closer. So you must be feeling a bit like Goldilocks right now. And um, I'm just here hoping to you that this time you get it just right. Good evening, Ryan Ellsmore, 11 Maple Avenue. Um, just quickly, because I know everyone's hot in here and uh, tired, but uh, I have a kindergartner starting in the fall, so I am new to this whole thing, and I must just say that I am flabbergasted. I never imagined that this would be this type of an issue, um, to just get basic level service funding for the school. So that's why I'm here tonight, um, to, to show the support to restore the level funding. And my, my comment really on this whole thing is trying to find out the information has been tough I think the true information on what the real issue here is for, for people. I didn't, I knew there was a school vote, but I knew nothing about it on that first one, really. So, you know, where is the information for people, for the town, to really know what are the true numbers? Because there's a lot of numbers thrown around out there. I don't think a lot of them are true. I don't, I think a lot of them are misleading. So I did my own research. I came up with a spreadsheet. And uh, anyway, it doesn't really matter what's on here. <laughs> uh, here it is. I calculated the percent of your tax dollars going to the school versus everything else. So you have one dollar of tax dollar. How much is going to the school? Well, back in 2009, before the drastic cuts from the state started, it was 64 cents on the dollar, according to my calculations, because this information doesn't really exist anywhere easy for people to see. Well, guess what? <clears throat> After all these cuts from the state and federal, we're still at 64 cents on the dollar. So I don't see how the school is this big pig swallowing up money when the same amount her tax dollar is going to the school now as before we, we had all these cuts. And I think the real issue is the cuts coming from the state. We've got to make up for that. Do we not? Are other towns making up for it? Do we have one of the lowest tax rates already anyway? So what are people complaining about? That's my question, you know. Like I said, I got a new kindergartner. I got a baby at home I'm trying to take care of, so I'm just kind of new to this game. These are my questions, and I think that things will change here today. And with this last vote, this is now a new 2,000 people <coughs> that are going to vote every time on every budget and every councilor seat, and they want to see at least level funding for this school. Hopefully, the state will change and we'll get more money from the state and this won't be an issue. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? Mm. 
Yes, my name is Drew Guire, 26 Ocean Avenue. I've, I've listened, I, I've, you know, <laughs> listened to everybody um, talk about the school budget being cut, and I feel, I feel sad that it really has come to this, and I feel sorry for you. You basically assigned the school board with with a duty to make a cut based on that first vote, and. Mm -hmm. uh, that was quite significant. It was 1,700 people said it was too high the first time, and 1,800 said it was too high the second time. That puts a, the onus on you to make sure it's right the third time because it can be long summer. I, I, I speak on behalf of elderly folks, pensioners, fixed pensioners, people on Social Security. They're not here tonight, okay? And we know they exist in Scarborough. We know. We see them at Hannaford. We see them you know, tractor supply. We see them all over Scarborough. And just because they're not here tonight does not mean they do not exist. I just hope the council keeps that in mind. <clears throat> if it were up to me, if, if I was king for a day, I'd look at the difference between the two highs and two lows, 5%, and I'd adjust that school budget accordingly, 5% and leave it be. The onus isn't on the council. The onus is on the school board, on the superintendent. And it needs to be <coughs> all this anger directed at you. I really do apologize. You know, it, it's misdirected. I, I, I feel as though the, uh, these comments, the commentary that occurred tonight should have been taking place at the school board meetings where it would be more um, accurately uh, absorbed and, and regarded. I have two kids in the system, in the school system, and I don't like, my, I have a daughter that's going into seventh grade, and I'm not too thrilled about her losing all those opportunities and programs. I really am not. But at the same time, I know there's several you know, older, po older folks that really can't afford to live in Scarborough. So if we, if we, if we get so... Uh, caught up in the mindset that uh, all kids and, and, and maintaining the school system, if we, if we for a moment lose sight of our elderly, fixed pensioners, it will be a sad day for Scarborough. We have to find the equal labor room. We have to find the tipping point, and I think we're there. I mean, 200, 200 votes, that's pretty close. That sounds like compromise to me. Um, if, the, uh, if the two highs voted yes on this budget, it would have been approved, and that's something to seriously consider. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brendan Fravor. I live on 1 Sarah Liberty Lane, and I want you to take these next words into consideration. I just graduated from Wentworth. I was a fifth grader, first class, to graduate, and now I'm going into sixth grade and moving into a trailer. I don't care. But when, you, when the school budget starts to cut all the after-school activities, that's when it starts to hurt everyone in the school system. And makes me unhappy because my friend, Alex Lehman, he had an older brother in high school who just graduated who worked for IT tech, and he loved it. And he wanted to be, and he was part of the news crew. And if the school, when the school budget cuts that, he's going to be really, really sad because he loved it. Everyone in this room who's a kid who loves their after-school activities is going to be so hurt if the school budget takes away those activities. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jason McGovern. I live at 14 Sequoia Lane, Scarborough, Maine. Um, there's a notion here, and it's been bandied about in social media and things of that nature, and I'm very resistant to it. I want to drive the numbers home for you, which is the fact is that there's this assertion that it's only a 5% difference between the two highs and the two lows. I think that's a very wishful way of looking at the numbers. Absolutely, it's correct, but they're, not, but they're completely lacking of context. Between our June vote and our July budget vote, the number of people who said that budget was too low tripled. 
of the 900 additional voters between the June vote and the July vote, more than 75% of those voters said the budget was too low. This is not some minor difference. I think if we look at everyone here, this is the voice of the town of Scarborough, and it's saying we want to restore the funds that were there originally. I think the fact that matters is that I, I stop counting. I, I think the speakers for the school budget, as opposed to those who are against it, and say that it's too high, it's at this point seven to one or eight to one or maybe even 10 to one. I think what we need to do as a community is come to a decision on this budget and then we have to address the bigger issue, which is how do we protect our students and not sacrifice our seniors in the process. And to kind of combine them together into one single issue because we don't like taxes or because we're anti-kids or because we're crazy spendaholics, it's, it's missing the larger point. We need to make sure our kids are taken care of and then we need to lay the foundation for a successful, thriving, vibrant community in the future. It seems to me like we're trying to do both at the same time and we're doing a terrible job at both. Let's split up the tasks and let's get it done and let's move forward so we don't start embarrassing ourselves uh, to the rest of Greater Portland. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, going, going, gone. So we are having our first reading and schedule a public hearing and second reading on the proposed fiscal year 2016 budget. Any motion? So moved. Is there a second? <coughs> Is there a second? Second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. And discussion. Bill. I would like to make an amendment to the uh, motion that's pending on the floor. Uh, I move to amend the motion to add the following language. <clears throat> uh, to add an additional whereas clause, which reads, whereas in an effort to reach a compromise, the town council appreciates the need to share in the responsibility of minimizing the impact on the property tax rate and therefore agrees to amend the fiscal year 2016 municipal budget. Uh, then replace uh, the now therefore, and I believe copies of these, Tom, have been yeah. made available? They're being circulated now. I fear I don't have enough. There's 85 copies there, so I would ask people to share if they, if they wish. <coughs> No, he needs to read it. It's a form of motion. Yeah, yeah you do have He's to just read it. For yeah. him to <clears throat> and I will uh, attempt to be able to summarize this at the end so that there's some clarity as to where the motion is in t the, the amendment uh, to the motion is intended to take us. Uh, this replaces uh, uh, the uh, now therefore clause with the following. Now therefore be it ordered that the Scarborough Town Council moves approval of the amended fiscal year 2016 town and school budget in first reading and schedule, uh, schedule a public hearing at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, July 22, 2015, as well as second reading. And be it further ordered that school budget be increased by a total of $180,000 and therefore the Scarborough Town Council hereby appropriates for school purposes the education operating budget the new sum of $43,473,756 and that the additional GPA allocation of $884,891 be included as school revenue resulting in the town of Scarborough raising the sum of $37,589,488 as the local share for the education operating budget. Be it further ordered that the town budget is hereby amended to include an additional $200,000 in excise tax revenue and to reduce town appropriations by $180,000 details of specific cuts to be recommended by the town manager and approved by the 
Finance Committee, the Town Finance Committee, for a new operating budget of $30,505,367, resulting in the local share for the municipal budget of the sum of $17,391,450. Be it further ordered that the final result of these changes produces a new total net budget of $57,760,277, resulting in a projected property tax rate of 2.8%. The fiscal note attached to this amendment summarizes uh, the uh, additional uh, uh, revenues and the reductions in expenditures as follows. Through shared reductions in expenditures and additional re revenue, this amendment provides for a total reduction in the net budget from the original budget of $1,584,891, resulting in a projected tax rate increase of 2.8%. The reduced expenditures uh, are $500,000, uh, as was in the previous uh, referendum, split $320,000 for schools, $180,000 for town. Uh, increased revenues uh, 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 result in uh, $1,084,891, comprised of uh, uh, additional GPA funds allocated by uh, the state of Maine to our school system in the amount of $884,891 and the town uh, adding uh, additional excise tax receipts of $200,000. So that was in the form of a motion. Is there a second? Second. And discussion, but Bill, why don't you go ahead and lead us into your amendment? Uh, I'll just cover uh, some comments about uh, all the two highs and two lows, uh, because people want to know why would we come together and vote for th for, uh, for this? Uh, if you voted no, it's too low. Why would you vote yes for this? Uh, I think our school board and our superintendent did an incredible job of trying to find a number that would minimize the impact of a cut. And that's where the $320,000 number comes from, not from the school board, not from, uh, not from the town council, not from any of us. Uh, what was indicated was that by cutting 320000 but no more, we would not lose all of the programs that would be uh, cut if we uh, had a cut up to $500,000. Uh, careful budgeting is going to be required. It's going to have to be uh, tightly manned. But we have the people who can do that. The school pe people who run our school are highly competent. Uh, what we're going to be able to do is not have to have anyone lose their job, not anyone uh, not get the raise that they are contractually uh, uh, obligated to receive. Uh, we have in this budget added two uh, special ed uh, teachers uh, as new staff because it was mandated by the demands of our special ed uh, uh, program. The people who mm -hmm. are being added to our special, and this is at the kindergarten level, so uh, we're adding those. We are uh, adding a one-on-one -on -one, uh, computing program at the high school, uh, a, uh, a program which the superintendent called a game changer. So this is uh, probably the most important additional component that is a capital item. doesn't show up in this year's budget, but it's already been approved. We're going to have that be part of uh, the public education system in Scarborough uh, come in the fall and forevermore. Uh, we added a full-time uh, 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 person in uh, the IT department to handle the school's new one-on-one -on -one computing program. Uh, it wasn't uh, mandated by law, but it only made sense. Why would we spend all this money on an, a critically important educational program and not have somebody there to make sure it was functioning properly? Uh, 
how can we do all of this, keep the program intact, uh, uh, and add necessary personnel uh, where we are proposing to do it uh, with all the cuts that we've been talking about? Well, mainly because we're increasing the budget from last year by $1.5 million. Just so you'll understand, it's not a cut. It's a substantial increase. Uh, but uh, uh, in fairness, it's, uh, it's going to require the school board and the school department to do a terrific job for us to manage their budget. But they've said that they're up for it and they can do it. Uh, why would you vote for this if you voted no too high? The tax rate is going to be 2.8% increase. It's uh, I can hear people saying, Bill, you don't have to say anything else. That, that is a tremendous outcome uh, from where we started out, given the problems we're having. We're still $200,000 short in school revenue funding. Uh, it's, uh, this is, if you're looking for the school to run themselves efficiently, this is an essential services budget, uh, a lean, a super lean essential services budget. Uh, uh, the town is saying, this is not the school's fault. Uh, the school uh, 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 caused uh, the loss of uh, state revenue because it's a good school. The formula says if you are a town whose property values are going up, you lose state funding. So by, there's no factor that influences property values more than, uh, than uh, running a good school. So uh, uh, the town is saying, we're going to contribute. We're going to uh, participate in this and try and make this uh, as painless as possible on the school for tax-conscious taxpayers. Be wary of squeezing school budgets. The schools are your best friend if your principal concern is maintaining uh, property values. Uh, any town that is known as a mediocre school system is not having their uh, property values go up. If you are a town that's known as being kind of divisive over school budget issues, uh, your property values are not going to go up. Should we be held accountable? Uh, should, should we have to answer tough questions? We, ha uh, we had uh, an enormous amount of information conveyed this spring. Absolutely. But be wary of squeezing too tight because a good, great school system is the best way to maintain your property values. Thank you. Anybody else wish to talk about the amendment? Wow. Yeah. Sean? Thank you. Um, so this being the first reading, I think that this is a um, nice baseline to begin that conversation. We do have a second reading and a public hearing um, that could persuade um, someone like me very easily to actually um, amend, particularly the school side. I do appreciate Council Donovan's attempt at finding what I think is a very reasonable compromise. <coughs> um, just for some historical perspective, last year's budget at the town level I believe started out um, and was approved at a 2.9% tax increase, and after actual assessments came back, it went down to 2.2. So this budget, as it's been amended here, is consistent with where we were last year. Um, as far as investment uh, in the school system, you know, being the chair of the finance committee, uh, we took a very lengthy and very thoughtful approach to the process this year. We had more meetings, both individually as a town council finance committee, but also jointly. Um, and it was always open to the public in which we, I have to say, very little public input. Very little public input. So when we look at the conflict that has been created, we have to, do have to step back and ask ourselves if our own participation, both being vocal and outspoken as well as not participating, has contributed to that. I think it's interesting that we're at this particular point for a couple of reasons. One is this problem did not start in this room. This problem started at the top of the hill in Augusta when they could have done a better job in establishing an educational budget for the state that would have allowed us to know exactly what we were getting because to have a 21% cut in educational support to then get back nearly all of that except for 120% says they did something wrong. 
And that's where our frustration and our focus needs to be. And it needs to be directed at each one of our state legislators and how they've participated in that. Because that needs to change. And I agree, I have always looked at this as one budget. It has never been about school spending. It has never been about even municipal spending. It's about the tax rate and how it impacts the families and on both sides. And the fact is, is that we were left with an eight ball and we had to keep shaking it trying to determine what was the best approach for us to be able to drive a budget for this community. Um, I actually uh, took a, a kind of a chance when we were talking about this before and I said, you know, I thought we were going to get six or seven hundred thousand. So for us to get eight hundred and eighty five thousand dollars additional is a pretty significant change and it does change the scope of uh, the debate. <laughs> and I think I want to um, kind of uh, take these amendments. I am going to support them on the first reading and think about them for the next one. Um, but there's one thing that I do hope that as a council that we look at next and one of the things is to encourage our state legislators to actually put in a bill that gets rid of the election or the referendum requirement for the school budget because it's nothing more than a conflict maker. And um, they're the ones that require us to do it. Um, not the legislators, of course, it's state law. But let's get a bill up there and let's all fight to get that changed so that we can treat this as one budget. Okay, Marie? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I look out at the sea of red and I have one call and I'm like, where have you been? <laughs> <laughs> no, I know that. Believe me, I know what that is like. Um, and I'm glad to see people uh, getting together, getting organized, and uh, presenting some pretty cogent uh, arguments as to you know why the school budget shouldn't be cut as much as it it has been. Um, like uh, Councilors Baybine and Donovan, I see this as a base, and I too am going to go back and give some thought. Uh, having heard testimony uh, this evening uh, from all of you who spoke, of particular interest to me was hearing directly from students who are, are affected. I, I give uh, young people great kudos for having the uh, courage to get up and speak because I know even as someone who's used to speaking in public, standing up at that podium is not easy. Um, so I give them uh, uh, kudos uh, for doing that. Uh, I, I too, am looking for a balance between the municipal budget and the school budget. I think that Councillor Donovan's amendment tonight, I will support it tonight because <coughs> I think it's a good step in uh, sharing the, the pain, if you want, so to speak. Um, but I still have an open mind and um, i got some more thinking to do. So, Any votes on the amendment? All right, me. So um, I have some comments from the amendment, and then I have some comments when we get back to the main order. Um, certainly, the you know I um, appreciate Ms. Councillor Donovan's effort and work into this amendment. I think it probably strikes a little bit of a happier balance. It does you know reduce our town budget some more. It does allocate some more funds out of the town. You know, ledger and off off to offset the tax increase. Um, it does offer, which is the point of contention for a lot of people. Um, we did get a presentation from the school at our last budget go around <laughs> and it kind of identified places that were, here's a shared service position, here's some retirement stipends that we don't need, they're staying on, so you know, we have an idea of what they can do to manage that rest of it. And the million dollar equation was the 180, which is where we've offered in this amendment to reinstate the funding for those types of activities like <coughs> wrestling and gay clubs and some of those other things. So um, it's my intention to support the amendment for now. Um, I will say, um, again, I do have some other comments after, but um, I, I would say that although I'm open to maybe thinking, I know there's some other counselors that are, are still pondering what this amendment is. Um, I don't particularly see myself going any deeper just because, you know, Sean has a fantastic point. We didn't have a crystal ball several months ago to mm -hmm. figure out where we could go with funding and, and what we would and we wouldn't get. And because we thought we were receiving such a loss, we plugged some significant, you know, reserve funds into that side of our ledger 
to try to plug those funding holes. And so I, I do just kind of keep in the back of my mind that right now with this amendment passing, obviously all 800,000 goes to the school as it should, but, but with this 800, um, with this amendment here, what we're talking about is next year we have a, a built-in, we have the 425, we released out of reserve. We've got 250 from Wentworth worth bonding that we rolled over into that debt payment. <coughs> We've increased school operating of 180. We, we, we've already got the 855 that there is no question of what we will have next year. It's a two-year state budget. So we already know anything above this point is built in tax increase next year. Um, so that, that's just something to think about. You know, you know, any further than this, it's just <coughs> built-in tax increases for, for next year. Um, I know that's a hard thing to, to kind of wrap your head around sometimes. But So on the amendment, anybody else wish to speak? All right. All those in favor of Councillor Donovan's amendment? It is one, two, three, four, five, six. That is unanimous. Yeah. All those opposed is none. So back to the main main motion. Um, does anybody wish to speak on the main motion? As just, amended. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, some of the things that we need to take into consideration, um, one is um, how we communicate our decision tonight um, and making sure that people understand it is just a forced reading. Um, also, how we communicate the next step, which is the second reading and public hearing. And then also the need for continued participation in this process because the outcome of every referendum isn't about what people want going forward. It's about reacting to something that's already been decided. So we need people to show up and to vote. Um, I did want to mention one additional piece about this process that I, um, regarding the state in particular that I think is extremely important. I think it was two days after the last referendum. Um, there was a, a great article that was in the paper in which Moody's, the, uh, credit, the credit rating agency, um, gave the state of Maine a negative rating because of its uh, uh, position on educational funding and not meeting its 55% obligation by law. And the fact that um, the state as a whole is now being negatively impacted on how they're funding education. So I think that speaks volumes to the challenges that we're facing as a community. And it did specific specifically mention that it's about the burden that the state government <laughs> is putting on the local municipal budgets and forcing us to use property taxes more and more to fund our necessities. So um, look for that article. It's a really good article when it talks about the challenges. Anybody else wish to speak on the main motion as amended? Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. Quiet. Interesting. Um, so I would just take a few minutes to, to talk about, um, we had a resident earlier that, that did come up and speak about this. I, um, I really applaud Mrs. Foley came up and spoke earlier about coming together as a community mm -hmm. and, and some of the really uh, atrocious behavior that's been going back and forth. Um, certainly everyone is entitled to their opinion. Um, certainly you should be passionate about what you believe in, but you should also still be a community and still be respectful that there's somebody else in a different circumstance that might have a different opinion. And I will gladly share with you that I, I've heard so many negative things about, well, just these are just beachfront people that don't want increased taxes, or these are just, you know, because they moved here for the kids, they just want everything. It, it's not about them. It's not about them over here. This is about us as a community as a whole. This is probably the best budget package we are going to be able to put together and move forward. And if somebody can't support it or didn't support it previously, I, one, hope that they can now because realistically we can't get any lower than this and any higher than this is going to be more taxes. So, you know, <laughs> there's no need to belittle somebody. If they can't afford $5 a week, then listen to them and tell them they can't afford it. It doesn't mean I'm grateful and glad that other people can, but I would never belittle somebody that can't. Um, there are people in this work in, in out there that are more than just retirees and more than just seniors. There are that working class 
area of folks that, that have seen things instead of, you know, increases for their cost of living aren't 1.2 or 2.5 or, or all these other things that we argue about about contracts. We saw in our household a 25 cent raise an hour. <laughs> So I got 10 bucks a week, <laughs> so, and that was after a couple of years of a pay freeze and a wage reduction. So you, know, you don't understand somebody else's circumstance. Do not put words into somebody else's mouth. That, that, that's really unfair and unfortunate. Um, the other thing I do want to just touch base on is um, I have heard it a lot. We do have a senior tax relief program. Mm. Um, although we have the program, we're extremely bound by what we can do with it. Again, our lovely state loves to meddle in our local affairs. There are very strict rules about how much we can give, when we can give it. Mm -hmm. There's a whole separate application process. If they don't file correctly with the state first, they can't get our local one. If they don't file a main income tax return because they didn't make enough, there, there's a lot of loopholes. There's a lot of problems with it. It is there. It's not great. Maybe we can try to work with our legislatures. I did bring that up in our meeting when we met with them earlier this year that it's a flawed program and it really ties our hands. Um, but again, we can, you know, can't fix that in a two weeks. <laughs> so, you know, bear, bear with us a little bit to make it a little better. Um, and. Um, I do want to just, the last kind of note I had wrote, written down for myself is um, as a total package overall, again, you know, we're revisiting the school, uh, the, the municipal budget. Um, again, there's a lot of feedback behind, behind that. Um, there was a lot of upfront work, I think, early on. You know, we did scrap road projects. We did talk about maybe going to a pay-to-throw program, which for our trash, and that was a <laughs> that was a roadblock of no from a lot of folks, but, um, you know, we are trying and, and we have done a lot of work up to date. Um, you know, certainly we've held the line on positions. We, we still have the demand, just like the school, you know, we, we're, we're hurting for volunteers. You know, it, it is what it is a little bit. Um, I will say there's nothing left in the reserve account. So again, I, I just want to reiterate, there's nothing left in the reserve account that we can offer to this budget. Um, again, nothing that we can change. There's no more rainy day fund. There's nothing there. And, and this is a little bit of a gamble for us as a council because we will be crossing our fingers and hoping, you know, there's a reason there's a reserve account. You know, if bad things happen all the time, we could have another horrible winter. Public Works blows its budget. We could not do as well in excise. The revenue didn't come in as we expected. Um, there's a lot of give and there's a lot of take, I think, with this proposal. So, Jim Marie? I'm sorry, I was. I have two quotations. Sure. Just a little add on to what she has to say. One is from Dwight Eisenhower, for those of you who don't know your American history. He was. Uh, the general in charge of his commander in chief of um, the Allied forces in World War II and president in the 1950s. And one of his favorite sayings was, the extremes to the right and left of any political dispute are always wrong. So just keep that in mind. And again, it's the extremes. So it feeds into what uh, Councilor Holbrook uh, is talking about. And then my other one is from uh, John Kennedy who followed Eisenhower. He was the uh, president who was assassinated in 1963. He was a huge proponent of education, and he's the one who started the space program, really got us geared up. And I, this is how old I am. I'm going to be 60 in August, and I was part of that. You know, we, schools got a lot of money back then. We were very fortunate as a result. But he said that our progress as a nation can be no swifter than our progress in education. The human mind is our fundamental resource. So I'm just going to leave you guys with that. Anybody else? All right. So this is not roll call, correct? Correct. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, if nobody else, last chance, last chance. All those in favor of the main motion? One, two, three, four, five, six. Wow, it's unanimous again. All right. All right. Well. Um, I think at this point, it's um, a been a couple break. hours. Let's take a 10 minute recess. Yep. Okay. <coughs> okay. Well, I mean,
are on to our next item, which is order number 15-057, first reading and schedule a public hearing and a second reading on the proposed contract zone from Avesta to establish a 50-unit affordable housing development at 577 U.S. Route 1. And um, before we take a motion, we'll have Tom just kind of lead us into... Well, we do have representatives from Avesta here and their, and their consulting staff and as well as Dan Bacon in the back, so if, uh, if you don't mind, I would uh, certainly prefer deferring to them so you can get uh, a cogent presentation. I, um, they're pleased to certainly go through uh, with as much depth as you'd like. Um, this is a matter you've heard before, <coughs> heard before planning board, so uh, Council Chair, what would you prefer in terms of presentation? Go ahead and have Dan just kind of bring us up to speed okay. on where we were at in our, in our process. Okay. Two Dan's, but um, Dan basically oh. <laughs> the, the uh, applicant's uh, consulting engineer is also Dan Riley, and um, you remember that in, in April there was a workshop with the planning board introducing this, and um, the planning board and council were supportive of the project and encouraged it to move forward. Um, so since that time, the applicant's been <laughs> planning board a number of occasions, working through uh, site planning issues and. Um, received a critical preliminary approval by the planning board um, at a recent planning board meeting, which is a, a key action by the board that brings it back to you um, for, for first reading this evening to uh, consider the actual contract zone agreement that's in your packages. And so the contract zone agreement outlines um, what relief or specific zoning allowances they need uh, to move forward with the project. Um, and I'm going to kind of let Dan walk through the details of those, but I think it's, it's focused on obviously the number of units, which was talked a lot about um, at the workshop, and then some other um, more secondary zoning uh, differences in terms of um, parking location and building height and a, a few things like that. But it's, it's primarily the number of units on the site to, to enable the, uh, the affordable um, nature of the project. So. Just in the interest of time, may I suggest, Dan, if you could just focus on those areas of relief that are necessary mm -hmm. and perhaps also some of the input you received from the planning board, just a quick overview of, of that process. Okay. Oh, yeah, I think we can be, uh, brief, be very brief. The, the uh, proposal that you have on the board here that was approved by the planning board is essentially unchanged from what we talked about when we last met in, in May or April. Uh, the project is a 50-unit <coughs> affordable housing development. Uh, that's comprised of eight units in the historic uh, house, Southgate House. Uh, it currently holds seven units that will be renovated to eight. And the proposed building, which would be set back behind uh, the Southgate House and one of the two barns <coughs> on the property that would be um, uh, renovated on a new foundation, would house 42 units. So uh, under the current zoning, uh, that is more units than is allowed by zoning. Um, when you take into account the um, historic preservation credits and the affordable housing credits that are allowed in the zone compared to what's allowed to what we're proposing, it's essentially six additional units when you do that calculation. 50 units total on the site, but six more than would be allowed under the underlying zoning. Um, so there is a provision uh, in the zoning to allow 50 units of affordable housing. Um, the second item related to use is the number of units in a building. The underlying zone restricts the number of units that are allowed in a, in a single multifamily building in the TVC3 zone. Uh, because of the need to or and desire to preserve the Southgate House um, and the unique sort of uh, conditions on the site, it really dictates where that building needs to be located and how many units need to be in it in order for the project to be viable and, and remain affordable. Um, and so part of the contract zone request related to the use is to allow the 42 unit to be unit building to be constructed. Um, a third item that's in the, um, in the contract zone relates to setbacks. Uh, the TVC3 zone has a maximum setback that um, is 75 feet from US Route 1. The existing Southgate house is set back further than that, so it's, not, it, it's an existing condition that doesn't meet the current zoning. And uh, as part of the historic preservation, working through that process, 
uh, the porch that's in the front of that building, which was added after the original 1800s construction, early 1800s construction, excuse me, uh, may be removed. So the setbacks increases. So we're looking for some relief, um, not changing the location, obviously, of the historic building, but uh, the setback from the front property line might change, and that requires a provision <laughs> in the contract zone. Uh, we talked about density. Uh, 50 units is being requested. Um, the other item relates to building height. Uh, the underlying zone limits new construction to three stories or 45 feet in height. As we talked about last time, the building is really constructed on two levels. The front of the building facing Route 1 uh, is three stories in height and meets the zoning <coughs> requirements. As the building moves to the rear, um, it steps down in elevation, adding a level lower following the terrain of the site and steps back towards the left property line mimicking the, the development patterns in the site and sort of masking the mass of the building. Um, it also follows the terrain to allow the construction to be more, uh, more cost effective. Um, that would necessitate an allowance in the contract zone for a fourth story. Um, we think we still meet the building height, but as is noted in the contract zone, um, the provision is to allow four stories with a building height of approximately 45 feet with the final height to be determined by the planning board through the, uh, through the site plan review process. Uh, and finally, parking. Uh, the underlying zone or the, and the, the, the ordinance, um, the land use ordinance in Scarborough determines parking uh, for <laughs> typical market rate uh, multifamily housing based on the number of bedrooms. Uh, it's either one and a half parking spaces per, for a smaller unit or two parking spaces for two bedroom units. Um, Avesta's projects, uh, we did look back at the, through the planning board process, uh, we did look at other affordable housing projects that Avesta has constructed in Cumberland County. We've looked at um, studies that have been done in other parts of the country um, that correlate affordable housing and parking demand. And in general, um, those studies support the fact that affordable housing generally requires less parking than a market rate housing project would. Um, there's some logic behind that in that um, lower income uh, people that would be living in these properties own fewer cars and Avesta's population often includes uh, people with disabilities that don't drive. And that's borne out uh, through, the, through the parking that's supplied typically on Avesta's project. Um, as we went through that process with the planning board uh, and through the site plan process, we are proposing to provide 55 parking spaces on the site. Uh, that is equivalent to one for each unit in the building with five additional parking spaces on the property. Or in terms of a ratio, it would be 1.1 um, parking spaces per unit. Um, as we talked in detail with the planning board, um, Avesta's other projects typically run at 0.6 to 0.8 parking spaces per unit. So it's a significant number of additional parking spaces when compared to other affordable housing projects that the, uh, that the applicant has uh, successfully developed over the years. Um, so with that, that is, those are really the main provisions in the, in the contract zone, and um, we'd be glad to go into more detail on any of those or, or anything about the project if you have questions. <coughs> So thank you for bringing us into an introduction of what this item is for tonight. Um, is there anybody here that wishes to speak on this item? All right. Seeing none. Um, we do need a motion from the council. Move approval. Second. Second. And is there any discussion or questions? Or I did want to just make mention we were made aware. Uh, we, received, <coughs> we received a letter, and I'll distribute it to you this evening, from uh, Ms. Gurley. She owns... Uh, Gurley Antiques Gallery, which uh, occupies a space immediately to the, I guess, left of this property, looking at it from Route 1, um, raising a number of questions. Uh, I, I, I'm not aware whether she was a participant in the planning board review process, uh, but there certainly will be a, other opportunities before that body uh, when they seek final um, plan approval as well. So I, I don't know if you need to take time to we do this in detail now. I just want to make sure it was received. Thank you. <clears throat> Any discussion? All right. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Um, well, say no other discussion. All those in favor? And that is unanimous six. Yes. All right, next item is order number 15-05A, act to certify the results of the July 7th, 2015 school budget validation referendum. Does anybody wish to speak on this item? All right, seeing none, close comments, and Senator of the Council. <coughs> 
Move approval. Second. And are you running, Cody? <laughs> <laughs> I know we've had some difficulty. If yeah, you would, I got it. Okay. Yeah. Would, um, okay. Would you mind giving us a recap of the um, election results? Um, there were the yes votes. Uh, were nine, uh, 496, the no votes were 3,584, there were 37 ballots that were invalid. A two high vote uh, was 1,838, <coughs> the acceptable vote was 177, and the two low vote was 2,047, and we had a 26 percent voter turnout. <coughs> Very good. Thank you, Tody. And any <coughs> discussion? Hey, Marie. I just want to thank um, the election staff for all of their work, because yeah. I know every time we have a vote, there's a lot of work. So thank you, Cody, and pass along to everyone, please. And anybody else? I would say ditto. Thank yeah. you, thank you for all of your hard work and your staff's hard work. And, uh, and, and she and gave up her July she third. gave up her July for yeah. us, and we greatly appreciate you. <laughs> You're underpaid. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Next item is order number 15-059, act on the request to set the date, time, and location of the school budget validation referendum. Does anybody wish to speak on this item? And seeing none, pleasure of the council. So moved. And a uh, uh, Peter second. <laughs> And discussion. Peter? I guess I'd like to propose that we think about removing sort of what the so-called Goldilocks question on this referendum, that the too high, acceptable, too low, and just go to a straight yes, no vote. Um, I think it was very, very helpful last time to kind of gauge where we are, but I think this time it's really important to, to try to get this passed, whatever number we arrive at at the second reading. So I'd like to propose that we think about taking that off the, the, the ballot this time around. And that's not a form of a motion. Second. And discussion. Huh? Um, not only is it good timing based upon the two prior, I hope that our, either the rules committee, rules and policy, I don't know, I know that this is a local decision. I don't believe it's a charter decision, but I think that we need to look at that, <clears throat> um, vet it about whether or not it's truly helpful. I think it's more of a conflict piece than it really is helpful. Um, so I think it's a great move to remove it. Anybody else? Um, <clears throat> I'm, I know, and Tody may correct me, but I remember when we first started doing this, we had a lot of spoiled ballots because people were writing on them. We still do. And we, are they still doing that? Okay, I was going to ask. <laughs> people were writing on the ballots. I think this is too high and whatever, so that was one of the impetuses for going to this. So just throwing that out there. Hmm. Anybody else? <clears throat> All right, well, um, on to me. So I, I think it's probably a pretty good, you know, gauge that first time or two out just to kind of, you know, pitch it out there. Are we hot? Are we cold? I, I think we know we're um, right, wrong, or indifferent. We're miles on either side. So, you know, this next one is it's hopefully, you know, a little closer, and, and, and I don't necessarily see the big need for the Goldilocks question. So with that, all those... Don't. You know, I, I think at this point in the process, it may be pushing people to vote in a way that they might otherwise vote the other way. You know, so uh, I I can see us eliminating it at this point in the process. Up till now, I think it's been very helpful to give us a sense of direction. But mm -hmm. at this point, I would not want it to be <coughs> an impediment to people putting aside their differences and compromising. Anybody else? Does, does this provide enough time for proper We're setting that right now. Yes. Yep. Okay. It's the same, uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to speak for you, but it is the same timetable that we were on with the <coughs> last, last one, which gives the two weeks on the end so that there's plenty of time to run in the papers. And um, The other thing I might just know, and I, um, Gosh, Ed, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> you just reminded me of a, a comment that I lost somewhere in my notes tonight. Um, 
there has been some discussion about the date and the time and, and feeling like maybe it's a little too soon or, or, or not soon, you know, not soon enough. I, I don't know. It kind of goes flip, flip a coin. Um, there is some method to the madness behind why we've picked this date. And um, the first and, and most important is tax commitment. Um, tax commitment will go out and the assessor begins plugging in numbers mid-August. So if we want a budget before ta first tax bills go out, it has to be the beginning of August. And there's no real good way around that. Um, and as Jean Marie has ever so eloquently pointed out to me from her real estate background that I didn't know um, about, Mortgage the, the mortgage companies need time to, to, so that you're putting your money if you have an escrow for, for your taxes. So again, you know, extremely vitally important that if we can pass one by the beginning of August, now that that's the time to do it. After that, it's kind of an issue for 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 some. So yeah, in fact, the assessor some. will not cannot set the tax rate until he knows what the need is, and obviously, this will delay that process. Mm. I think it's probably worth noting, and perhaps there's differing opinions, but uh, the reason we propose this timeline is uh, in spite of many of the comments we heard this evening that there's voter apathy at Scarborough, I don't know the exact statistics, but I, I, I dare say that we're one of the best in terms of voter turnout, mm -hmm. even on these elections. Oh, bar not. That 26% of voters turn out this past election is quite impressive, frankly, in early <laughs> July, right around mm -hmm. the holiday season. Uh, and I think it's important to keep not momentum, because I'm not sure, I think we're kind of spinning our wheels, so it's not <laughs> momentum, but, but it keep this in the collective consci consciousness and that uh, people are talking about, about it on the dinner table at the grocery store, mm -hmm. and hopefully we can expect a similar turnout in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, all those. Oh. So we're voting on the amendment, correct, to eliminate? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we have the main motion? Okay. Just want to make sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So, on the amendment, which is to remove the Goldilocks, <coughs> all those in favor? That is unanimous. Back to the main motion, which is the date and the time. Any discussion on date and time? On. So, um, I, I do appreciate the chairwoman um, explaining the um, how it was set, because a lot of people, you know, um, make comments about, oh, we're trying to not be as transparent, we're rushing this, um, when if you actually take into consideration the full scope of everything that we've done, including um, committee meetings um, during the budget process. We started this last no at the end of November, right. um, so um, which is unprecedented by itself. I do think that at least for um, well, we have this in front of us. No one actually said when the election actually is. So I think on the record, if I can just state that it's going to be on August 4th, and the polls open at 7 a.m. and it will be at town hall. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Just like it was last time. So just to be honest, because we've got the document, no, everybody else is listening. <laughs> um, so, so I appreciate the clarification. Um, I, I, I think that um, the citizens of Scarborough know what they want, and I don't think we need to take any extra time. And I think that we need to get this out so that people can move on and uh, move on to the next order of business in the town, which includes looking at our budget process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. Yeah, they can't return them until then. Would you mind, um, yeah. <clears throat> would you mind, Tony, just talking to us about? Uh, I know, I know it's hard. <laughs> um, absentee ballots are available starting tomorrow. You can pick them up, but you can't return them until the 23rd, which is the day after the final vote of the budget. And then open voting would start on the 23rd. You can just come in and vote absentee in the town clerk's office. Thank and you. And then the Friday and the Monday prior to mm -hmm. the election is a closed period. You have to have a special circumstance in which to vote those two days. Thank you, Tody. Perhaps a further point of interest, you may recall uh, when this was discussed at your second referendum, there was a, a request and the council obliged, I believe it granted an extra week uh, between second reading and the actual election day. And in fact, I quote me, tell me if I'm wrong, I think we had 1,048 people cast absentee ballots. Yeah. So clearly that was uh, an important feature, and this timeline provides for a similar time frame mm -hmm. between the second and final reading uh, and the actual election day itself. So we would hope and expect a similar turnout for uh, absentee voting. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All right. All those in favor? That is unanimous. Uh, 
Item number eight, non-action items. There are none. Item number nine, standing and special committee reports. We'll start with you, Sean. I have none today. Oh. Uh, Energy oh. Committee oh. continues to work uh, on uh, the uh, uh, trash, uh, uh, kind of the pay-as-you-throw uh, process that was thrown to them. Uh, and it's been actively uh, under consideration, and we're gaining information and doing an analysis, and uh, I fully expect it'll be a good report once it's done. Very active. Debris. No. Oh, yes. A um, couple of things. People who live in my neck of the woods up in North Scarborough, uh, we will be having another follow-up meeting with PACs regarding Gorham Road issues, the traffic issues in Gorham Road and County Road. And that will be August 25th. I don't have a time or the place yet. I was just given the uh, date. So people may want to put that aside. Um, <clears throat> I also went to a broadband meeting last week that was sponsored by Cumberland County Commissioners. It was very interesting. I got a lot of you know, preliminary information, met a lot of the players uh, in the broadband field. Uh, I also had a meeting with Karen Martin from SEDCO today, and um, we're putting together a plan for moving forward for exploring um, fiber in Scarborough, because mm -hmm. I think that there's a real need for that from an economic development point of view. <coughs> Other than that, I don't have anything else. Okay. Oh. Uh, the only meeting I had was the planning board, and I already reported on that. Thank you, Kenley. Nothing significant to report. So. All right. Um, I have nothing strenuous to report other than um, Historic Preservation um, Implementation Committee is going to have its first meeting Tuesday, July 21st at 6 p.m. Um, to elect mm -hmm. officers and, and just kind of review their duty in charge. Um, outside of that, next item is Town Manager Report. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to uh, touch on a couple of things. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to be there, but this afternoon at 4 o'clock, Ready Brother <coughs> Seafood had a groundbreaking or ribbon cutting, I guess is the better term. Uh, this is a state-of-the-art uh, lobster processing, holding and processing facility on Pine Point Road um, uh, down next to the clam bake. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those that attended, apparently it's a very impressive facility. Again, it, they're using state-of-the-art uh, processing technology there. And uh, they seem very pleased, and I think they're a welcomed addition to um, the Pine Bank community. Um, also, I wanted to update, we have begun the work on the retaining wall. It's back here by the skate park. Um, the contractor we hired is doing a terrific job. He's keeping the site very tidy and secure. And we expect within a couple of days of today, we, we should have that work wrapped up. So I'm pleased to report that. Um, when thinking of budget matters, we are getting ever-increasing claims to or requests to clean the beach more frequently, uh, Pine Point in particular. Uh, there's, uh, our long-standing practice has been to do it Friday mornings once a week, and for a number of reasons, and some are legitimate, um, that, that's not enough for certain of the, the residents. <coughs> so it is a budget issue for certain, and we're working the best we can during the season. Uh, one of the challenges we're facing is a particularly new kind of seaweed, uh, some sort of Asian, uh, I'll call it red seaweed, that uh, has a, a fairly offensive odor associated with it. Uh, so it's not just being unsightly, um, it, it really is distasteful. Uh, so we're working um, to see if we can come up with some short-term solutions, but I just wanted to kind of make you aware that that's an ongoing issue for us. Uh, the Trigen facility right behind us here at Town Hall is moving along very briskly. Tomorrow we expect the main engine, if you will, to be placed uh, on site. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll be fired and up and ready in about two weeks' <coughs> time. There'll be some commissioning and breaking in period. Uh, so I expect by September 1st we'll be fully operational. And I guess the last piece, uh, I'll deviate from kind of the report. I just wanted to provide a comment or two on the cut to the municipal budget. Um, you know, that does not come very easy. And I, I certainly understand how it fits into the, this puzzle, and I, I appreciate its importance in terms of um, helping provide part of the solution to, to get to a, a, a different point. Um, this won't be easy for staff. I think we put together a solid budget to begin with, and we've been compl complimented as such. 
uh, but I would expect my staff will do as they always do and be thoughtful and thorough in their evaluations and we look forward to working with the Finance Committee uh, should that cut come to pass. Uh, but I just wanted to say a few words to the fact that it's, uh, it's not going to be without some pain. I, I'm sure of that. Good luck to you and Finance Committee. <laughs> and um, we're now we're on to council member comments. We'll go ahead and start on one. Peter. Yeah, I guess, I guess a couple of comments and I think I pick up on something Sean said. I hope part of this process has been as we've gone through the budget process, I hope that we can start a process and really get folks involved and see what we can do to create a different process next year so we don't have the same type of, of process that we've had that, that takes us to this path. So look forward to doing that and encourage everybody that has some ideas out there to send them to us so we can think about how to do that. Two, I do want to compliment Tom and his team for, for accepting the challenge of trying to find that, you know, it was a pretty tight budget to begin with. Was there with. an option there? I, 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 I <laughs> well, but tremendous leadership, for, so thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, and I guess with that, I'll, uh, and then the, I guess the third thing I'd like to say, and you know, there's been a lot of use of social media this time, but there really becomes a time when some things start to really cross the line. And in the last couple of weeks, there have been some emails that counselors have received that really cross the line into very personal, they really feel threatening in some ways. And I think that gets to what Katie Foley said earlier tonight. We as a community should be able to find a way that we can have a difference of opinion, be civil, be respectful, listen to others, and find a pathway to move forward. But when it starts crossing over into f people feeling threatened or it being personal, I just hope we can all kind of pull back and agree to disagree and do so respectfully. So thank you. And? No comments. Jim Ray. Um, <clears throat> just real quickly, um, it, it, this again, this budget process is been brutal this year. And this, this is only my second year, so I'm not sure if it's always <laughs> like this, but it seems particularly it's so. It's fun every two it's years. It's fun every two years, yeah, with the state, but mm -hmm. that's another story. Um, just to remind people that, you know, my colleagues and I here on the <coughs> town council, we're left with everything and we're trying to work a balance um, that is to go back to the Goldilocks question, either too high or too low, but just right for folks. Um, and. And it's frustrating sometimes when, as I mentioned before, when you've got extremes, you know, hammering us with emails. Um, and, and, and I think that's fine, and I want people to contact us. We want to hear from you. But, again, you know, we're trying to work something that's, that's moderate, that's in the middle. So just a couple of things I want to make note of that I'm proud of uh, this town council for supporting the computers in the high school. We've taken a lot of baloney about that. Ongoing, ongoing. Um, I think it's a great investment in our future. Um, I'm pleased that we have agreed as a council to share the pain. And I, again, uh, thank uh, Manager Hall for um, working with us on that, um, for allowing us to, you know, relook at the municipal side of the budget to try to help out the school side. Um, I know I've told you that personally I see some merit and increasing what we're giving back to the schools, and my number personally would be 250. But again, I need to balance with the rest of my counselors also, and I would I prefer to see something come out with a near unanimous, if not unanimous, out of this council in a second reading for where how we're going to move forward because we're sort of. I don't want to say sort of, we are the role models or should be the role models and the leaders for what, how we should be behaving and working in this town. So that's, you know, where I'm coming from uh, with that. Um, I, I'm very proud that we've pushed the tax increase down to below 3% because I, that's something I was hearing from a lot of people who were very concerned about the increase in taxes, particularly given the horrific tax shift that we've endured from Augusta. I mean, it's been brutal there too, and I hate using the word brutal all the time, but it, but it has been. Um, and I am proud that uh, I've been working with, uh, together with all of my fellow counselors, and uh, look forward to 
seeing what we come up with next week and get people out and tell people <laughs> that, you know, pay attention to what we're doing. Again, you know, remember we're we're all flawed human beings. Um, it's not going to be the perfect solution, but it's going to be the best we can do. And uh, I, I really want to see all these groups stay involved, even after this budget season. Uh, parents staying involved the way they've been involved. They've done a fabulous job, um, and, as well as, you know, hearing from those who are impacted by taxes. I think it's important. So anyway, that's it. I've talked enough. Thank you. Yeah. I, I wanted to commend uh, Chief Moulton on the article that was in the paper about courtesy. Uh, and uh, I'm glad Mike Thurlow uh, probably extended the courtesy of uh, allowing Chief Moulton to write that article in, in a space he usually occupied. And I, I really enjoyed the article. I thought that uh, that said a lot about it isn't all just about laws. Sometimes it's about just using good common sense and judgment and being courteous. So I, I enjoyed the article. Uh, and in that regard, I wanted to commend the uh, department directors for accepting as, again, with good grace, uh, this proposed reduction in the town budget was an unprecedented step. Uh, and for people on this council to accept it uh, and uh, uh, allow it to be part of the solution, I thought was, uh, showed the flexibility of trying to partner with the schools and, and try and get us past this. Uh, uh, as far as you know, the process and, and whatnot. I thought Sean and Chris Caesa ran it beautifully. Uh, so I thought there was, uh, <clears throat> I didn't have so much objections to the process that we went through. I don't think we've ever had a more open, uh, <coughs> uh, informative process. But uh, there is a divisiveness that, to me, there's, there, we look to real solutions. And I think seniors who need tax relief is a big part of that. Uh, and so uh, I think that's where a, a more effort needs to be put. And there are people who I've been working with uh, who are going to hopefully help me to understand uh, the complexities of that issue because it is, there's no easy solution yet devised by the state. And we are very much a dependent of the state. Uh, in, in coming and advancing the interests of our low-income seniors. So that's where I would see uh, putting some emphasis uh, 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 in the time ahead. As far as uh, uh, people uh, uh, sort of acting inappropriately to us, I've had plenty of that directed at me. Hmm. So I can certainly join in that uh, once you've been under surveillance and had FOIAs and uh, uh, been uh, called out by people from the podium many times. Uh, you, your skin gets thick, uh, and uh, and so, uh, but it nevertheless is very disrespectful. Uh, it doesn't change the fact that someone might be able to simply endure it. It's still very disrespectful, and that's really where we need to be: is more respectful of each other. Sure. Thank you. A um, couple of things. One is just wanted you to know that um, I've gotten a little crazy and decided to join another committee, and I will be um, <laughs> I will be uh, joining the uh, Cumberland County Budget Advisory Committee, uh, representing our district. Um, I believe that's going to be hopefully approved at their next commissioners meeting in August or late July. Um, and it's very important if you if you don't know what county government provides to us, um, primarily because it does have a significant impact in what's happening at the state level, at that level, um, at that level of government. One of the 70 bills that's currently in, um, that's law, but uh, was vetoed or whatever your status you want to call it, um, is one of the, um, the county funding law. It's oh, the county okay. funding um, issue. And so um, there is a significant gap that was originally proposed in that budget <laughs> of about four and a half million dollars. And um, Scarborough, as one of the larger communities, would actually have seen a near doubling of its portion of, uh, of the increase of um, about 10 to 15 percent 
Um, so it's a significant issue for us to focus on what that costs. And we have a really good commissioner in, in uh, Commissioner Neil Jamerson, so I've decided to join that. Um, on a good positive note, this young lady who is sitting in the front <laughs> row made my day after listening. And um, you know, not to, uh, I'm not going to use her name. I was going to originally because um, she was just the sweetest thing. Because she actually was getting a little upset. Um, at the comments and at the things that we're saying, and so you know, I couldn't really look at her because little girls crying, it just you know, it breaks a dad's heart no matter how old they are. Um, and she made this awesome picture and came up and said thank you. I don't know what the citizens <laughs> so can see, it, but I got, was I got one of these, mm -hmm. and, it's, and she came up and said thank you. And so I'm going to take it home and I'm going to frame it and put it on my um, my refrigerator because it really made my day. And she spelled my name perfectly and she even said oh, it correctly. So she was awesome. awesome. It was awesome. <laughs> so I just wanted to say uh, thank you to her. I'm going to send her a card. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. It made my afternoon. Um, you know, the budget, um, um, what's the word? I've got to say it politely. <laughs> you're darned if you do and you're darned if you don't. No matter what we do, we're going we're gonna to be pointed at. We're going to be told that we didn't do it correctly, that we weren't transparent. We didn't provide enough information. The information was confusing. No matter um, how early we start that, when you have a budget that people don't want, they're going to say that it was wrong. Um, I take very strong pride in the, in the budget that I consider was jointly submitted by a finance committee of, comprising of school board members and town council that I was very proud of. I voted yes on the first one. I voted yes on the second one. And I'm going to vote yes on the next one, no matter what the amendments are, even though I'm still open to the discussion about what they should be. Um, because I think, one, we need to move on. Two, you know, I did go back through my notes, and um, the proposal that's being made is better than what I originally thought we were going to be at. Mm. I originally said that I would be comfortable anywhere from three and a, um, uh, three percent to three and a half percent. The last budget that was presented was three point one three. This is now two point eight. So, this is well within the comfort range, um, if not um, an opportunity to maybe to look. It is hard for everyone to go through this process, but I think that the only thing that we did not do in the budget process is have a value conversation about what we want in our community. Mm -hmm. um, and even though we did significantly change through the manager's um, great work about how that information is presented to us by the department heads, we did not have that conversation. And that's the piece that's missing. And that's the piece that we really need to focus on. And I think that's because, um, to some extent, um, you're automatically put at a defensive. As counselors, we're automatically put at that defensive by people who thought it was too high. And now it's people who think it's too low. Um, and it's about ju the justification of that process. The most significant thing to think about, at least in my head, there is an $800,000 investment in our schools that's not even being discussed because it's off the, the balance sheet or off the operating expense which is the technology. We wanted that for six mm -hmm. years. I remember that was the, one of the last things that we were arguing about six years ago, which was my last year, on my second term, I think it was. So to me, this is a huge step forward, especially if you, not to become a wonk in, in education, but if you think about where education is going, we're late to the party again. Um, this actually will hopefully prepare us for the next stage of education, which I think makes public education more competitive with private schools as well as with virtual schools as well as with charter schools because of the opportunity that technology education can provide and a virtual curriculum. So I think that this um, is a huge plus. It's going to require a huge investment over the next several years and every four years when there is a replacement. So I think that there is a significant positive in this budget. Um, the last uh, two pieces, um, I'm going to end on it, and I'm going to save that last one for it because it's a positive note. You know, um, we, we've all had uh, comments uh, or made comments tonight, or most of us, about um, courtesy and respect and some of the emails that we're all receiving. And, you know, um, we all kind of, at least some of us know what those emails are. I've gotten a couple myself. Um, I think it is an absolute abomination of what people are saying out there some of the personal things that they're saying to people and counselors in particular about their families, about their children, it's wrong. We're not creating that as counselors. The school board's not creating that. It's the people that are responding to the situation. I can personally tell you, and it's funny in a way because of the misinformation that's out there, I've been attacked um, you know, verbally um, because people thought I went to high school care. 
I didn't go to high school here. I went to Morris High School. Then it was because I actually worked for a local business, which I don't work for anymore and haven't for about a, you know, six months. And most recently, it's because they found out that my daughter was a Cape Elizabeth graduate. And they don't think I'm fit to sit on the town council because she graduated from a different school district. I mean, this is ridiculous. Hmm. Absolutely ridiculous. And the other things that we know about that I'd love to be able to say, it's not my place to say it, you know, I just want to reach out and give those people a hug because um, we don't have to go through that. That's not part of the job. The family piece is, is not part of this. And as far as I'm concerned, I think every council and every school member who gets one of those emails has a right to fight back and tell them to stop. I will, and I will always do that. So um, it's wrong. It's wrong that it's being allowed. It's, it's wrong that people are doing it. So uh, <coughs> it's not just about courtesy. It's about um, basic human kindness. You know, um, I have no problem. I've been doing this a long time, since 1999, 2000. And so I do have thick skin. But when it comes to family and when it comes to that personal stuff, stay away from it. I don't have a problem with anybody attacking my opinion about the budget, attacking my decisions as a counselor, <coughs> that's fair game. I asked for that. But my wife didn't ask for it, my daughter didn't ask for it, nobody else's family asked for it, and it needs to stop. And on a good note, to talk about family, I did want to congratulate um, Mrs. Donna Beely, the chairwoman of the school board. She became a new grandmother for the <laughs> first time, and so I wanted to congratulate her and wish her uh, good luck with the new, I think it was a grandson, so um, both her and Roger, who serves on the planning board, so I um, wish them best of luck with that. And back to me. <clears throat> so um, I, I won't spend quite so much time covering it as eloquently as some of the other counselors, but um, I, I will will say, you know, uh, th there has been certainly an exceptionally large amount this year of really just low blows and, and, and things happening. And again, not necessarily my place to say, but I, I will say this. Um, I won't speak for another counselor, but my, my own experiences, you do. You have to develop a thicker skin. And absolutely, agree with me, disagree with me, that's okay, attack my position, absolutely. But in the same token, I want the same thing everybody else does. And, you know, to say I don't care about seniors or I don't care about fixed income people, I mean, I have family in this community. I have parents. I have in-laws. I have grandparents. I have to go look my grandmother in the face every Monday because I take her to all her doctor's appointments now. Um, I have two children in these schools. And, and if anything, our last budget hurt me personally and my kids Probably the most. The, the the only sport my children play is wrestling, which is one of the three programs proposed to be cut. So, you know, I, I say to everyone, as I would tell to my father, who stands at the podium sometimes, makes for great Thanksgiving conversation, <laughs> um, we all have to give a little. You know, my parents, my grandparents need to help support my kids, and my kids need to understand and realize but it can't be the farm, you know? <laughs> so there's a balance there. And, and trying to meet in the middle a little bit and saying, I can give a little if you can give a little, and, and let's, let's move forward because I'm going to die on my nice little farm. So that's where I am. <laughs> and that's the last of my comments <laughs> for this evening. Item number 12 is adjournment. Is All those in favor? Have a good evening. <laughs>